Welcome to Compassion in Action. I am so excited to bring you my guest, Dr. Vince Folletti, the co-author of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which has basically changed the way we understand what child abuse does to the brain, body, and spirit. We talked about how important it was to reveal our secrets and not hold them and to release the shame of being abused because holding on to that shame makes us think that we're bad somehow when we're really not, that we we were treated badly and that we're not bad people. And that's the real distinction that we really are coming to realize in our society. We were, we, bad things were done to us and we're not bad people. Um, so here's his bio, Dr. Folletti's bio. Vincent J. Folletti, MD, is a co-principal investigator with Robert F. Anda, MD, at the Center of Disease Control of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, ongoing collaborative research between the Kaiser Permanente Medical Care Program and the CDC. Dr. Folletti is a graduate of the John Hopkins Medical School, who started as an infectious disease physician in 1968 and then founded the Department of Preventative Medicine at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. He served as the Chief of Preventative Medicine in 2001. He is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Folletti, welcome to Compassion in Action. Doctor, you created the Adverse Childhood Experiences Quiz with Dr. Robert Anda. Yes. And this has changed the way the world perceives childhood trauma. Um, my first question is to you, how did you come up with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Quiz? Well, that was easy. <laughs> Um, the, the study really began in the middle 80s because of counterintuitive findings that we were making in a major obesity program that I had put into my department at Kaiser Permanente here in San Diego. We were using a new technology called supplemented absolute fasting. <clears throat> that enabled us to take a person's weight down incredibly, approximately 300 pounds a year. And we were doing that. And um, I uh, was amazed to find that rather than being happy, many people were terrified by the major weight loss. And in exploring that, we stumbled first into the issues of childhood sexual abuse where many, many patients, women more than men, but many of both, <clears throat> acknowledged histories of childhood sexual abuse, producing severe anxiety, which as children they could most easily resolve with, by eating, you know, sit down and have something to eat, you'll feel better. And then they discovered that as they became obese, that that was beneficial. It was protective against social, against sexual interest. As we went down that path, <clears throat> which was, again, surprising enough, believe me, it took me some time to accept what we were turning up in terms of volume of acknowledged childhood sexual abuse, we discovered many other adverse experiences in childhood. And ultimately, when the question came up, is this just due to some bizarre group that you've managed to accumulate somehow, or is this true of the general population? That's when the CDC decided to help me translate our findings <clears throat> into a major study. Wow. And the major study was to involve 26,000 adults. Kaiser Permanente is a very high volume organization. And so given the special operations of my department, we were able to handle that. We were seeing 58,000 adults a year in one setting for unusually comprehensive medical evaluation. And so <clears throat> when, when we decided to do the ACE study, we simply picked the 10 most common, not the only ones in the world for sure, but the 10 most common adverse childhood experiences that we had kept uncovering in our obesity program. 
And the obesity program, it's important to understand, was a very clearly middle-class population. 80% white, including Hispanic, 10% black, 10% Asian, almost 1% American Indian, 74% had been to college, um, almost exactly half women, half men, everybody with high-end medical insurance, etc. So these are the 10 most common, but isn't that a biased sample? Yes, of course it is. But if things are this bad in a clearly middle-class population, well, they sure don't get better if you're living on the street or you know, a recent immigrant from some war-torn corner of the earth, et cetera. But question number 10 is about prison. Um, a, a household member going to prison. So, so that population, that, that Seven that seventy four percent were white. That included them as well, right? Of, of course, yeah. And again, I was really so surprised. Five percent of the Kaiser population in the ACE study acknowledged a history of having had a childhood household member in prison. Okay, and I, you know, come on, five percent, and you know, and then it suddenly occurred to me that I knew, knew two physicians in town one of whom was a national figure whose sons were in the penitentiary. Wow. And nobody knew that because they didn't go around talking about it very much. But no, well, I, I guess that's true. It's just, you know, something that is totally unrecognized. And, and so in the obesity program, for instance, overall in a 1,000 person sample, 55% of the men and women in the obesity program acknowledged a history of childhood sexual abuse. Again, it took me a number of months to accept, you know, I mean, come on, you know, if this were true, people would know. Well, people really don't want to know. And we have all been very effectively taught as children that nice people don't talk about certain things and surely don't ask questions about them. Well, and so basically you're saying over half of the people that are sexually abused we're in the obesity clinic, right? I mean, that's what we're under, I mean, so. Oh, no, what I'm saying is the reverse of that, that over oh. half of the people in the obesity clinic acknowledge the history of childhood sexual abuse. <clears throat> when we pose that question to in, in the ACE study to a major uh, uh, middle-class population, 28% of the women and 16% of the men acknowledge the history of childhood sexual abuse. Wow. And um, our findings in prison, the women, the amount of sexual abuse is basically almost every person who answers the ACE yeah. test. Yeah. Um, and so, and the other thing that's so, um, to me, so stunning about the ACE quiz that you've put together is what you've also uh, illustrated, one of your, your two top questions, your two beginning questions, often or very often, um, would a parent or adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you? So it's it's the amount, it's not the one incident of being um, emotionally abused. It's the repetitive, repetitive. Yeah. And that's that creates a sense of, of un, un, unsafety, of not being safe, of not being valued in your household. Well, two, two concrete examples to keep in mind. I re remember a patient telling me when he was growing up, his father used to tell the kids, you kids ought to just be taken outside and shot. Oh. And many times hearing from patients, particularly women who molested as little girls, tried to tell their mothers only to have their mother say, oh, you're misunderstanding. Grandpa or your uncle would never do that. Don't say things like that, et cetera. So, you know, they were told essentially to be silent. And that, of course, intensifies the, the issues at hand. And it also, the parent, the parent has stopped protecting the child. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which is basically um, neglect. I mean, so yeah. suddenly in that moment, you have two aces showing up, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, that neglect is, you know, they and they say what I'm learning about childhood development is that first year is so crucial. Yes. Um, 
of development. And, and so, and your second one, did a parent often or very often, you know, hit, push, grab, slap, or throw something at you? Also the physical abuse, but it's the repetitive. And it's, but it's also what I'm, I'm coming to understand is that we don't, they don't know when it's coming. Like there's a, like if it was, if they knew every day they were gonna get hit at five o'clock, that's one thing, but it's the irregularity that actually creates even more um, toxic stress and and hypervigilance. Yes. Um, so I'm I'm sorry because I use this ACE quiz every day. I look at it. I it's just it's just part of what I'm doing. So question number seven with domestic violence, it's really targeted with the woman getting abused. And in my family, it was my mother who was abusing my father. And so I've included that as part of my ACE score um, because I just felt like this is, it's the same thing. It's its two parents not not adoring each other. And, yeah. and so is that, first of all, is that okay to do it? And is there a reason why we didn't include the um, men versus, is it because of, I'm sorry, is it because it wasn't as prevalent as the woman being abused? Exactly. It, you know, it, it might have been number 12 or number 13 or number 15, et cetera. You know, it's, it's a real enough thing. We just arbitrarily selected the top 10. <clears throat> and, but you also in your, what I've come to understand talking about talking with you a couple of days ago that you have a very thorough questionnaire that you have your patients fill out. And so do do those questions include all of these, all of these yes. questions? Yes. Ah. Yes. And that was a, a very interesting thing too. <clears throat> the health appraisal division of my department of preventive medicine provided uncommonly comprehensive medical evaluations of 58,000 Kaiser members a year in San Diego. Step one of that two visit process was filling out a 10 page medical history questionnaire at home. So after the ACE study opened up, you know, a number of new realities, I decided to integrate the ACE questions into the 10 page general medical history questionnaire. My colleagues assured me I was crazy, you know, patients will be furious, no one will tell you the truth anyway. Um, totally incorrect. Well, ultimately, we did this with 440,000 adults over a multi-year period, literally zero patient complaints. Colleague complaints, absolutely. You know, if I wanted to be a damn shrink, I'd have been a shrink, I'm a whatever, or, you know, what the hell am I supposed to do with that information? That was 50 years ago. So, so um, you know, it was, it was really uh, a so, so we're doing this for about a year or two, integrating the ACE questions in, and uh, a mathematician at the University of California gets wind of it. He has a startup data mining company, and he comes by and, as a gift, offers to do a 135,000 patient study at no charge. That's two and a half years throughput for the department to see whether adding the ACE questions has any effect. He finds incredibly that it triggers a 35% reduction in doctor office visits in the next year compared to their prior year and an 11% reduction in emergency room visits in their subsequent year compared to their prior year. Now for any big organization that has multi-billion dollar implications. In 2008, I was invited to address the Vermont state legislature because of this. They saw the implications of it for their state Medicaid budget. Two weeks after I was there, I got a letter telling me that they have passed legislation designed to support the collection of ACE information routinely in medical practice. And I was very pleased but I was also thinking, well, you know, how realistic is that to think that a state legislature can, can bring that about? Since then, 22 more states have passed similar legislation, most recently California, and the California experience illustrates how it is done. 
Last year, they put up 100, the legislature put up $135 million for two purposes, to disseminate information about the ACE study findings throughout the state to the general public, and two, to provide an additional fee of $29 to any physician seeing a Medi-Cal patient and collecting ACE information and recording it. So a very interesting idea. And um, you know, I don't know what the Medi-Cal budget is in California, but with 30 million Californians, I mean, it's you know, gonna clearly be in the high multi-billion dollar range and knocking 35% off that. <laughs> it's certainly gotta be pleasing to people. It's, it's simply common sense. I went to my doctor recently for my annual and I said, um, do you know about the ACE study? And she said, no. And so I educated her and she says, well, to get this implemented into our system, it would, you know, we'd have to go all the way to the top. And I'm like, well, you could start with yourself. I mean, but my father had high cholesterol and he died at 61, which presents as having six or more ACEs. I don't know about the extent of his abuse, but he was a heavy smoker and an alcoholic. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with six because um, that's what I'm sensing. I also have high cholesterol. So that's, so I'm, I want to know, is that, is that genetic? Is that because I have eight ACEs? Do you know what I'm saying? So, but to be able to discuss that with my doctor seems like a natural, a natural thing for a, as someone who knows, who wants to know about their, their health and what they need to do to, you know, start getting care instead of being, you know, I, you know, I'm 58 with eight aces. I've, you know, if I'm, and I've been taking care of myself, but my life expectancy is not as great as, as someone with no aces. Oh, no question about that. Yes. <clears throat> and, and the question is why, how does that come about? And there are three categories of explanation at the present time. First is through the implementation of various coping mechanisms. Okay, so people are in distress and emotional distress because of what's happened to them in childhood. Some people will eat to get relief, some will drink to get relief, some will smoke because of the psychoactive benefits of nicotine. Some will buy street drugs, and that's an interesting insight because our most common street drug presently is crystal meth. Everybody's heard of it, you know, bad stuff, people die of it, etc. Virtually no one knows the first successful prescription antidepressant introduced for sale in the early 1940s in the United States was methamphetamine. The very same pharmaceutical compound that is sold in impure dose and unknown strength on the street as crystal meth. Does that mean anything? Well, it means we're going to do something to help us feel better no matter what, exactly. whether it's legal or illegal. Exactly. And, that, and that's a key insight of major magnitude. Because what we saw then was that many of our most difficult and intractable public health problems are indeed that from a societal standpoint. But from the standpoint of the person individually involved, they are unconsciously attempted solutions to problems that typically we know nothing about. Memorable patient. I have a video clip of this woman, uh, elderly woman, massively obese, heavily molested as a child. She treated that by three pack a day smoking, which helped her a great deal because nicotine has significant benefits in reducing anxiety. It's got major risks, but those are long term. The risks are 15 or 20 years away. The benefits are within 15 or 20 seconds of inhalation. <clears throat> So she becomes a three pack a day smoker. She remains slender because the smoking helps with that. <clears throat> she gets married and at age 35, her husband convinces her to stop smoking for her health. She weighs 130 pounds at that point. 
suddenly after stopping smoking, she's flooded with male sexual attention that she's never had to deal with before because as she said, you smoke three packs a day, the cloud around you keeps people at a distance. She's very anxious, doesn't know how to handle this, eats to reduce her anxiety. That works. She also starts putting on weight and she goes from 130 to 308 pounds. Oh my God. I'm sorry, to 330 pounds. <clears throat> At 330, she's a middle-aged woman now, she goes into acute and chronic respiratory failure because the lung damage that has been building up from the smoking all along, she could handle at 130 pounds, but not at 330. Wow. So she comes into our obesity program. And we take her from 330 to 150. She no longer needs the 24 hour day oxygen that she had been on to treat this. And we naively thought, you know, we've done something wonderful. The male sexual attention returns at the lower weight and she consciously makes the decision to get back over 300 pounds and solve the problem and accept the fact she's gonna be on 24 hour day oxygen the rest of her life. So here's this woman with basal oxygen clips in place who makes to me the memorable comment. It's important to recognize that smoking three packs a day and weighing 300 pounds are not the problem. Mm -hmm. They're the symptoms of the problem. And I thought, wow, you know, I wish I had met you 50 years ago. It would have, would have made my career a lot easier knowing this at the beginning. I mean, my heart just, it breaks for her. The, I mean, what a ride she, she went on trying to, yeah. trying to get healthy, but ironically, health for her was actually smoking. And I mean, that's what's ironic. It's, it, it, and- no, because the problem is not correctly, rec the causality of the problem is not recognized. Oh, the reason kids are fat is because that damn McDonald's is in town. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, yeah. there are plenty of slender people who eat in McDonald's. McDonald's is an intermediary mechanism it's sort of like the idea that you know people are depressed because there are neurochemical changes in their brain that cause the depression. Well, that's not true. The neurochemical changes are real and they are intermediary mechanisms. It's life experiences commonly in childhood that produce those neurochemical changes that then manifest as depression. I'm just gonna tell you, my parents smoked, my father smoked two packs a day, my mother one and a half packs a day. So when, when you said the anxiety, like they get immediate anxiety relief, it, it, it kind of just, it was, like, it was like a shock to my system. My sister's also, she's alive and she smokes one or two packs a day as well. So, and I've been living with anxiety all my life. I just took it out yeah, I just took it out of my environment instead of, you know, with road rage or, you know, promiscuity when I was a young woman, you know, those are, those are some of the results of my anxiety, but we have an anxious society, don't we? I mean, if, if 64% of Americans have at least one ACE, that's 64% of Americans in some kind of anxious or depressive state. Yes, that's correct. But do you think the 64% is correct? Because I'm sensing it's much higher. I don't know why, but that's my sense is that based on what's going on in our, our society, we're all, we're all in fight or flight. Well, it, you, you, you could be making a correct point. That wouldn't surprise me. I mean, remember the A study was 17 and a half thousand people, clearly middle-class uh, group whom we followed after detailed medical evaluation, we followed the next 20 years. Now, if you were to include people living in poverty, people who are homeless, people who are recent immigrants from some war-torn corner of the world, yeah, I expect the A score would be distinctly higher. Wow. I, I, I have not studied that group. Somebody else will. The World Health Organization for a number of years now has been using the ACE questionnaire annually with 20 European 
and eight Asian nations collecting this information. So that 64% number is based on just your test. It, we haven't redone it. I mean, oh, wow. other, people, other people have redone the ACE study in, you know, in smaller uh, samples. Uh, and basically, you know, they're turning up the same thing around the world. There'll be variances in prevalence, but basically they're turning up the same thing around the world. Wow. So 64% in a middle class? Because what I'm thinking is when we do the census, we should do the ACE test when we do the census. So we really have a, an understanding of the mental health issues. I mean, because this is what, basically what you're saying or what you've demonstrated is, is that we're, this is a mental health crisis. It's, even if it's just the middle class, we're in a mental health crisis and nobody wants to look at it. Nobody wants to talk about it. And except now you and I, I, mean, <laughs> I know other people are talking about it, but that's what, that's what your study is, has brought to light. But this was 20 years ago. Yeah. It's like, why aren't we, why aren't we treating, we have homeless people everywhere. We have addicts. We know, we know this is because of probably most likely of how the 90%, probably 95% of how, of their childhoods and, and their pariahs, the people, the heavy people, the people are overweight, the obese people, the people that smoke, we all look down on them. We're not, there's no compassion for them. We're just like, you are out of control. Why aren't you controlling yourself? That you're making a choice, but is it a choice, Dr. Folletti? Well, it's an unconscious choice, I think, because people realize that they're not going to be comfortable talking about those things and therefore they avoid it completely. And typically they're smart enough to say, you know, not to say that they're embarrassed, but you can't ask patients questions like that. My God, they'll be furious and no one will tell you the truth anyway. Well, <clears throat> when we integrated the ACE questions into our general medical history questionnaire, many times a week over the years, I would be stopped in the hallway by patients who were going home at the end of visit two who would say to me that they would like to thank me for asking those questions in the questionnaire and often would go on to say that they were all so grateful to the examiner who might have been a physician or a nurse practitioner to the examiner who having heard the dark secret of their life was still nice to me and they would go on to say you know they want to see me again you know as though they couldn't believe that somebody would have learned this dark secret about them and still was nice to them and wanted to see them again. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's been a very, very interesting experience. Would that questionnaire be possible to um, share with the public? Oh, of course. Because I think, I think this needs, you know, I think people- That has actually been done on a small scale. A number of cities around the country um, have taken the ACE study one-page version of the questionnaire, <clears throat> published it in a newspaper, asking their readers to anonymously respond. And then they pool the anonymized data, publish the pooled data, and it galvanizes community attention. Have you seen what's in the paper today? My God, you won't believe it, et cetera. And the newspaper publishers are very pleased because their advertising rates are based on readership. <laughs> this sure as hell massively increased readership rather abruptly. <clears throat> so that's been done. Another approach, similar approach though, would be, uh, let's say you're in school, juvenile hall or, you know, grammar school or high school. Hey, you kids ever written a play before? No? Well, let's write a play today about a kid who's growing up in a house where somebody's getting hurt. What's the kid's name? And where do they live? Where's the house in town? We're out in the country and who else lives in the house? And what are they like, etc. It's a useful approach because, hey, I'm not talking about me. I mean, this is make-believe what we're writing here, we're learning how to write a play. 
etc. Or with that same group of students, having them anonymously fill out the one page ACE questionnaire, pool the data, bring them back together in an auditorium, put up the pooled anonymous data. What do you guys think this means? And again, freed of, you know, freed by anonymity. I mean, hey, this isn't me. I'm talking about everybody else in the room here. People are likely to be quite open in their, in their responses. What an incredible idea. Let's get every university in California, no, not in California, in the United States to pull their, their population. And let's get this conversation started. I mean, high schools, and I say high schools, I, I, what do you think the age should be to really, to bring this, these, I mean, like I hesitate to, my son knows about it because this is all I talk about, but I hesitate, middle school, do you think this is appropriate, an appropriate? Yeah, I, I, I think it probably would be. It's a simple enough experiment to find out, to see. <clears throat> and it being, I, yeah. I think so. And the nice thing about it is when parents are gonna complain, you know, hey, we're not asking your kid about his life experience. We're teaching him how to write a play, et cetera. Okay, but I'm I'm back to the ace quiz because I just want to cut to the chase. So cutting to the chase, I, I love the play idea too. And I think that that needs to happen. Um, of course, you've seen the, the movie Resilience um, yes. done yeah. by Jamie Redford, yeah. which I think was really fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I, I think this awareness is, is key. I, I mean, I have to tell you, when I found out I was traumatized, it changed my entire life. It, 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 it gave me my, my sense that I'm not my personality, my rage, this rage machine that I've, I portray to the world. And I mean, I'm still at the, at the effects of it, but I'm aware of it at least, which is just, which is, yeah. it, it's, it's grace. What you've created is a piece of grace. I mean, it just makes me want to cry. It's, you're, you're giving us our, our sense of who we are back. Um, sorry to be so emotional, but I, I, you know, I'm really like this awareness when I brought this ACE quiz to, to the prisons, it's given them a sense that they're not the bad people that they've been labeled and, 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 you know, yeah that have had bad things happen to them. You know, I mean, it's an interesting thing in, in the media. You know, you'll read some flamboyant story about some mass murderer, et cetera. No one ever poses the question, who the hell raised this person? I posed the question. I wrote to um, a man on death row that we just recently executed. His name was Wesley Perkey. And um, his ace, he came back with an, a 10 on his ace quiz and he sent a story, um, not a story, but he wrote about his childhood and he said his father blew his brains out on his childhood bed. And so this kind of, and, and, and the way he, he told this, um, this, this tale or whatever, this report, however he reported it, you could see his father was doing it Vindic for vindication for the kid to yeah. really just sh shove it in his face. So that that's this guy that, you know, he, he, uh, you know, killed two people and horrifyingly, horrifyingly. And yet it was horrifying being Wesley Perky. Sure. Sure. And so we executed this man. And so what we've done is also horrifying. You know, it's, it's still another, it's another level of horrifying instead of rehabilitating him. Um, and I had that thought of, um, there's that man, um, Willie Horton, who got out. I don't know if you remember, he got out and suddenly all of our, he, and he got out and he killed somebody. He killed a family, I think. And suddenly all of our rehabilitation and like all the rules just got really everybody was like, we can't let anybody out of prison again. And it's like, well, no, we didn't rehabil We didn't do anything to make sure that our streets were going to be safe with people coming back out. Um, but I mean, well, using the questionnaire in the prison or juvenile hall, you know, 
anonymous, bring them together. Here's the pooled results. What do you guys think this means? Yeah, the that's what a... enables people to speak more freely than they might otherwise do so. That's a really good way to frame it. What do you think this means? Um, so as you may or may not know, we've sent over 2000 ACE quizzes to the prisons and anonymously um, some of the, one of the men he's been asking, he's been distributing the ACE tests and um, some people just don't wanna answer the questions. Like I think sexual abuse is a big one. They just don't wanna, even anonymously, they don't even wanna put it down. Uh -huh. And so how do you really get, how do you know that you're even getting your your, your answers are actually correct if, if they're well, in, in our 17 and a half thousand person sample you know 28 percent of the women acknowledge childhood sexual abuse 16 percent of the men acknowledge you know maybe those numbers are higher even but they're so damn high to start with that even if they were higher you know you've got the problem to face right with the information that you have as, as such, even though it may be worse than what you have. One of the stats that we found is that um, with four or more aces, you're seven times more likely to go to prison. Yeah. And, um, and can you explain what happens when you have more aces physically? Like what are your, what are your findings on the health outcomes the more adverse childhood experiences a person has has endured well okay so so there are three categories three pathways by which adverse childhood experiences lead to disease in adults the first one is the easiest to understand through various coping mechanisms okay so i smoke three packs a day or i become an alcoholic or i become promiscuous or some combination of those all of those are done because of the short-term benefits. They've got major long-term risks, okay? For smoking, obviously, lung cancer, heart disease, et cetera. So that's fairly easy to understand. Namely, that the things we consider public health problems because of the long-term effects are really personal solutions because of the short-term benefits, okay? What are you, crazy? It's like trying to say smoking is beneficial? Absolutely. Nicotine has been known for about a century to have potent anti-anxiety activity within 15 or 20 seconds of inhalation. That's why people smoke. Okay, it also reduces appetite. You know, that, that helps. It also, I mean, American Indians figured out centuries ago that it reduces anger. They were burning tobacco leaves in their peace pipe, not oak leaves or moss. Hmm. Maybe they knew something, huh? Wow. <laughs> the peace pipe. Wow. Yeah. So that's one category of pathway. The second category is far more complex. It's due to the result of so-called toxic stress on brain function. Toxic stress, meaning stress reactions that are playing out decades after the fact. And one of the activities they have is to hyperstimulate certain areas of the brain, you know, 50 years after the fact, still going on, <clears throat> causing suppression of one's immune system. Well, how does that matter? Well, we all are, most people don't know this, but I'm about to say, we all are forming small numbers of cancer cells every day. Our immune systems recognize them, destroy them, and we never know that that's going on, but it goes on routinely all the time. Small numbers of cancer cells from a wide variety of organs in our bodies. With immunosuppression, with immune system suppression, that destruction no longer goes on those cells are free to multiply and become manifest cancer. Example, everybody knows that if you get an organ transplant, you have to have beyond immunosuppression the rest of your life so you don't reject the organ. Some people will correctly have heard that one of the side effects of lifetime immunosuppression by medication is an increased risk of cancer. Well, okay, you know, if I'm gonna die without the kidney next week, 
I'll take my risk of getting cancer 20 years from now. Okay, but it's a very real thing. And that same effect is produced by toxic stress. There's a remarkable autobiography out, probably one of the most open autobiographies ever written. It can be sampled on Amazon. It's titled Judging Me, written by a woman named Mary Elizabeth Bullock, a retired United States federal judge. She describes in detail the long sexual abuse history by her father as she was a little girl. Worse yet, he used to bring her into saloons to sell her to strangers for sex. Somehow she does not commit suicide. She does not become a mass murderer. She graduates high school, gets a scholarship to college, graduates, scholarship to law school, graduates, becomes a law school professor, ultimately a United States federal judge. I mean, that's a big deal. It would be very easy to say, isn't it wonderful that that little girl with that hideous history has been so resilient. It shows the weakness of our conceptualization of resilience. We base it on economic success, social success, occupational success, academic success, etc. We do not routinely look at biomedical outcomes. Judge Bullock has had five different kinds of cancer, not relapses, five different kinds of cancer and three autoimmune diseases, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and rheumatoid arthritis. In the A study, we looked at 21 different autoimmune diseases to see if they had any relevance to underlying A score we found a clear dose response effect of 16 of those 21 to underlying A score. Wow. Okay, another effect of toxic stress on the brain is the release of pro-inflammatory chemicals. These, amongst other things, cause inflammation of the lining, the endothelium of blood vessels. In the tiniest blood vessels, they shut down completely, turning to scar tissue, whatever piece of organ they had been supplying. In the larger vessels, you know, the big enough you can see with your eye easily, in those vessels, the inflammation of the lining produces a magnetic effect that pulls cholesterol out of the blood as it flows by, regardless of whether the cholesterol level is high or low, obstructing the vessel causing damage like heart disease or stroke as a result of the blood vessel obstruction. This is really you know, a very interesting thing. It's fairly new knowledge. This is all within the past 10, 15 years or so. And then the third category is by so-called epigenetic effects. Epigenetics refers to the effect of social and environmental influences on gene function, not on gene structure, that would be a mutation. Epigenetic effects means that a chemical on off switch is placed onto a gene. The structure of the gene is perfectly normal. It's simply turned off, okay? Mm -hmm. And this can occur during pregnancy. If a woman is stressed during pregnancy, it can turn off gene functions in the baby that is developing in her uterus. So these are the three pathways that are known at the present time that explain how does what happened to a little kid affect their health, well-being, and survival decades later. Wow. It's, it just seems like... Um... It seems like such an obvious thing that we need to take care of our children and at, at all costs. It because it, 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 this is a health crisis. Child abuse is a health crisis. The biggest public health advance that I can think of in our present times would be to figure out how to improve parenting skills across the nation. Yeah. Not 
by conventional didactic techniques, you know, lectures, books, pamphlets, etc., but probably by depiction, by storytelling, by developing a serial television program that had woven into the storyline illustrations of what supportive parenting looks like and how it plays out decades later what destructive parenting looks like, how it play, plays out decades later. So the people could look at this, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, I could do that. You know, seeing what it looks like. <clears throat> well, yeah, one of the things I wanted to, um, that's, a, um, that's an incredible idea. I'm a filmmaker, so, you know, maybe we can talk about that on a, another conversation. But you were talking about, um, suppression of the immune system. And what we're dealing with in COVID, this times of COVID is there are people aren't surviving and this comorbidity, could we relate a lot of it? I mean, I'm sure child, child abuse and adverse childhood experiences are part of it, but just trauma in general. Um, I think you're, you're probably right. That's yet to, that's yet to be proven, but I, I, I think it's probably correct. I mean, oh, it's clear that major obesity is an added risk factor for COVID. I mean, you're more likely to die from a COVID infection if you're 100 or 150 pounds overweight, let's say. Well, okay, but is it really the obesity per se, or is it the factors underlying the obesity that are the engine underneath all of this? remembering my patients saying it's important to understand that smoking three packs a day and weighing 300 pounds are not the problem. They're the symptoms of the problem. Exactly. The symptoms of trauma. It's, it's one of the things I make sure everyone who does the circle, the trauma circle reads so they understand. Um, we, we don't have, um, we don't have her example in it, but you know, things like hypervigilance and Hyper arousal and and those, you know, basically being in fighter. From what I'm gathering, this is my own algorithm. But being abused as a child puts you in fight or flight for most of your life. Um, yeah, I'll well, see. another video clip I have: a, a very obese elderly woman. She's explaining to me how her psychiatrist has told her that he would refer her for bariatric surgery, which would be a covered benefit from Kaiser Permanente to treat her obesity. And she's explaining to me why she turned down the offer. And she says, but what would I do if I needed to be fat again? Wow. Wow. Yeah, kind of a memorable statement, isn't it? What, what would, I... would I do if I needed to be fat again? Like, you know, being fat is, she realizes, protective to her. Yes, and then... Or, or uh, I remember in the early days of the obesity program, we had two men in the program who were guards at the state penitentiary downtown. One guy lost 100, the other 150 pounds. They were both very clear that they were no longer comfortable walking into the cell block's regular size. They felt a hell of a lot better going in looking big as a refrigerator. And you think of our expression, throwing your weight around. Oh, hmm. An interesting analogy. And what's also interesting is the life expectancy of a correctional officer is 59 years old. Is it really? Yes. How interesting. <clears throat> How interesting. So that, pre <clears throat> that presents as six or more aces, right? That's basically losing 20 yeah. years of your life. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and so the, basically, what you, what you just said, they wanted to armor up, right? They wanted to armor up with their with their weight, but that's for to protect them. But then they died twenty years old, you know, yeah. sooner. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, this is. I, our society and course, has, and of has... course, many people are not really concerned about dying 20 years early. As another memorable patient told me, I'm not interested in serving out a full life sentence. Wow. Wow, Dr. Folletti. Yeah, i.e. suicide. 
<clears throat> well, suicide by living, right? By 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 no, destroying by, yourself. By, you know, by just letting your disease go unchecked and yeah. You know. Which is similar to addict behavior. Um, Absolutely. And what you said that the sh the short term benefits outweighed the long-term um, consequences, which is- Involved, absolutely. But this is prefrontal cortex, lack of a prefrontal cortex, because the consequences consequences are in the prefrontal cortex, right? So fight or flight is, this is a fight or flight decision, so if you call it a decision. Yeah, that, that's true, but I, I'd prefer to use plain speak more, uh, you know, than naming pieces of the brain. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm amazed how many patients I've spoken with over the years, initially in the obesity program, but then later related to other things, smoking, drinking, who were very, very clear about the short-term benefits. Yeah, you know, yeah, fine, you know, I understand about getting lung cancer from smoking, but that's 20 years away, you know. <sighs> I need something to help me now. <clears throat> right. And be about 20 years from later next week when things are quieted down. Have you found anything that helps people like heal? Because this is. Yeah, probably the most useful thing that we have found is enabling a person to tell someone important to them the dark secrets of their life and realize that they're still accepted by that person. People used to ask me when they heard about this 35% reduction in doctor office visits, you know, how do you do that? You sent everyone to therapy, right? No, we essentially sent just a minimal number of people to therapy. Well, how do you do that? We spent a number of months thinking, how the hell did we do that? And ultimately patients helped us recognize you know, the one stopping me in the hall, thanking me for asking those questions, and then going on to say how grateful they were to the examiner who having heard the dark secret of their life, you know, was still nice to me, wants to see me again. <clears throat> that reducing the internal stress level by that approach. Ultimately, I saw that we had really invented a lay analog of confession in the Catholic Church. And I'm not saying this as a religious person because I'm not, but confession has been in use for 1,800 years, you know, suggesting hmm, you know, maybe it meets some basic human need to have lasted 1,800 years. And that process, which is minutes long, involves telling somebody important to you, a priest in that case, an ours, a doctor or a nurse practitioner, the dark secrets of your life and realizing minutes later that you're still part of the group, you know, you're still accepted by this person, they're still treating you nicely, et cetera. Um, very big idea there. Well, that's what we did at prison. We had everybody do the ACE test and they told their stories of, of abuse, horrendous abuse, and they started healing and And keep in mind the idea, you know, could you expand that by writing a play? as a group? Could you expand that by putting up their pooled anonymized data on a screen, you know, bring 30 or 50 or 100 guys together in an auditorium? What do you guys think this means? And freed of individual identification, people tend to be much more open about sharing their understanding from their own life experiences. What an incredible idea to start 2021 with this initiative. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm, well, gonna... I'm reminded of <clears throat> hearing a person, Peter Sellars, a, a famous Hollywood producer, director, not to be confused with Peter Sellars, the English comedian, uh, speaking down here uh, about the role of theater and, and the memorable statement, the role of theater back to the time of the ancient Greeks has been to enable people to speak about things that are otherwise unspeakable. In other words, hey, I'm not talking about me. We're talking about what's up on the screen. We're up on the stage there. 
It's the shared, and it's the shared experience of seeing your story told on the screen. Yeah. Um, it's actually another cathar. It's catharsis, which is another Greek thing, right? This is all. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we need like we need a, a universal catharsis right now. Yeah. And universal, what I universal understanding. But what I I see that you did when your patient you t told his darkest secrets and then he still was accepted is the shame that he'd been carrying was lifted, was, was exposed. And in that exposure, he wasn't rejected. And, and what I'm, what also happened with the men, the men that I worked with, with their exposure, not only were they not rejected, they were comforted and held. And it was almost an antidote to, to the way they were treated as children. Mm -hmm. And it, in, in that in that holding is the healing, is the healing. And, you know, right now we want to do this program. We we have a trauma-informed program we want to bring to prisons and there is no way to get people in groups. So we're trying to figure out how to have that experience while you're sitting in your cell. And this, because the cell is, we're in there for another year probably, you know. This is really treacherous for the men and women living in prison right now. Yeah, I, I doubt that Zoom is available in prisons, but if it were, that would be, you know, one way of approaching it. The other way would be to, you know, sit down and talk with a warden about setting up a simple experiment. What about doing this with 25 prisoners? That's not going to pose any riot threat to bring them together, you know. So you get a couple of guards to sit on the outside of the group and you know just test out you know what happens. Is this a peaceable assembly, or you know, or a dozen, twelve people? Twelve people, and then they teach twelve people, and then then every then suddenly you have a trauma informed prison. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between trauma informed and trauma responsive in your in your understanding? I, I simply am not familiar with the word trauma responsive, so I can't. Oh, okay. Well, I'll. People might mean by that. Um, well, this is it's this term that it's trauma responsive. So instead of, it, we're all informed, like you and I are both informed. But when someone's acting, acting out, there it's how they respond to that situation. And if you're trauma informed and trauma responsive, you realize that he's probably being triggered in that moment. And it's really for like cops and correctional officers or people people yeah. in the medical field. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so in my mind, hearing what you're saying, it's a poorly ch chosen phrase because my first thought was, well, trauma responsive must be like, how do people respond beneficially when they understand trauma? Oh. Okay. And what you're using is the exact opposite of that. How do people who have been traumatized respond to the trauma that they have undergone? Well, it's actually for people working with traumatized people. Okay. Or how do you respond to you know, traumatic behavior in other people? You know, one way, obviously, is with revolvers and clubs. But you know, another way is to enable people to speak about their experiences. There's a, there's a man, a psychologist at the University of Texas, James Pennebaker, P-E-N-N-E Baker, who has studied the role of autobiographical writing in medical settings. And you might again sample his book on the Amazon website. Um, and, and I'm, I'm impressed by the number of people, uh, I've patients even, uh, or of people I've otherwise met who have written openly in books about their life experiences uh, and, and how that was remarkably beneficial to them. And, and Judge Bullock being a good example. 
And do you recommend that for everyone in like, let's say for the people in prison writing about their autobiographies? Yeah, well, you know, uh, for, for many years, I would with patients uh, tell them, look, I, I'd like you to start autobiographical writing, you know, do it on a computer, do it with a, uh, you know, uh, word protected for password protected file, etc. And I'd like you to write me a detailed autobiography of your entire life in five year segments and then mail it back to me. It's not gonna be part of your medical record. Uh, you don't need to uh, you know, worry about that. And, and it, was, it was a very beneficial process. Oh, it sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. It transferred enormous amounts of meaningful information to me at no cost in terms of time, et cetera. So it was you know, really a very efficient way of accomplishing meaningful things. Incredible. Um, I'm going to have, I'm going to add that to the curriculum for sure. Write an autobiography and yeah, in, in small segments, small segments. So just, you know, write about a year, your six year, when you, you know, were six five years of life, the next five years of life, the next five years of life, et cetera. And if you keep that on the computer, then you'll begin to remember, oh, you know, I forgot what happened to me when I was seven years old. Well, fine put the password in, open that file and make the addition to it. Incredible. Um, I have a couple more questions, um, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so if you were to build a trauma-informed society, um, how, or how do we convince the world to be trauma-informed? What would you say is the, I mean, it seems like such a no-brainer I, I try to set it up on a small experiment to start with, you know, maybe a county, et cetera. Uh, could we introduce these changes? Well, what will the changes be? In my mind, very clear. Figure out how to improve parenting skills across that county or across that school or across, you know, whatever. And then once you have that data, and can analyze it. Okay, so this works, that, that didn't work, so we'll just drop that, et cetera. And then, you know, try that on a larger sample, et cetera, and pretty soon you have people begin to follow. Well, like, you know, like the reason 23 state legislatures, I mean, my God, I have no idea how the hell state legislatures run or anything about them, but that was all an outgrowth of one invitation to speak to the legislature in Vermont one of the legislators there was a obstetrician gynecologist in town, you know, in his other life. He had heard of the A study, invites me to speak. And, you know, they passed laws to support using this. And 22 more state legislatures do it, most recently California. I mean, a really interesting story. Uh, a, a, Pediatrician in San Francisco, Nadine Burke Harris, okay? Lovely young woman, but basically an obscure person. She's running a poverty pediatric clinic in a neighborhood most people have never heard of. She hears of the ACE study, decides to integrate it into her operations. She is remarkably skilled at getting through bureaucratic obstructions. Somehow she manages to get to talk to the governor about this, <laughs> convince the governor of the importance of it. He creates the role of California Attorney General. He makes her the first occupant of that new office. <laughs> Surgeon General. Sur Surgeon General, yeah. Surgeon General, California Surgeon General, yes. I mean, you know, it was really just impressive to see what she was able to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, th then the legislature puts up $135 million to help with this idea. Um, she's a very effective public speaker and writer. And, uh, you know, isn't a, well, actually, <clears throat> with what you're doing in prisons, you know, when you, when you get a piece of it organized enough, you might consider writing her a letter and sending her sending her that information because I suspect she might really be quite interested in this. 
Oh, I'll send, I, I have a letter I'm starting right now. Um, but so there's 20, 23 states now, 23 that are now ACE aware. Is that what we call it or trauma informed? What would you oh, call that? 23 state legislatures have passed legislation designed to integrate the findings of the ACE study uh, into state operations. Now, does that mean the whole state is ACE informed? Good God, no. But it's an enormous step forward. You know, yeah. as I say, the World Health Organization is using the questionnaire routinely in 20 European and eight Asian countries. I get speaking invitations literally from all over the world. I mean, a while ago from Dubai, a couple of months ago from Estonia, just completed one in Chile and in Turin, Italy. Um, you know, I, I get emails a couple of times a week from people in countries that I have to think, you know, <laughs> which hemisphere is that country in? <laughs> who want to know, can they use the ACE questionnaire in their PhD thesis? Can they use it in their clinical practice? And the answer is, of course, yes. Wow. I, I can't underestimate the, how, how important your work is and how it's literally changing the world. We just need 20, 27 more states, right, to climb on board. Then we'd have a trauma-informed yeah, you know, country. Happen because this happens in, you know, 23 states in a 12-year period. That's, you know, in an 11-year period, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's get 27 more states in a one-year period. Let's have the rest of the United States be trauma, trauma-informed yeah, and you know, ACE-aware. Figure all the people that are getting involved in this, you, Nadine Burke-Harris, et cetera, all of them will have different ideas about how best to approach it. It'll help us figure out more quickly, you know, what's most likely to work, et cetera. Uh, the two big ideas I have are one, to develop for broadcast television, a serial program that through the use of storytelling and depiction will really be a means of improving parenting skills across the country. And then two, to put onto the internet free, a really comprehensive medical history questionnaire that anyone who wishes can fill out at home, adding their name after they disconnect so we don't have to worry about hacking or anything. And if they wish, hand that to their physicians, many of whom will not be grateful for the information, you know, what the hell am I supposed to do with this, et cetera, but a significant portion, I think, will understand the importance of this and begin to integrate this into medical practice. Well, Dr. Filetti, so I'm, I'm looking for someone who can help me understand how better to approach that problem of getting something like that on the internet, you know, in an optimal manner. You may have found that person in me. Um, I don't okay. know. One thing I do know is I would like that questionnaire so I could send that to all the people in prison. There's 22.2 million people in prison. Okay. To so have. I, I will uh, email me to remind me and I will mail you the male and female versions of the questionnaire that we developed at Kaiser uh, and have used with, uh, well, as I said, I think it was 400, and, well, it's probably more than four, it was a minimum of 440,000 Kaiser members over a multi-year period, but all in San Diego. Wow. And I would also like the correctional officers to fill that out as well. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna publish any of this information. Now, the one thing that you need to realize, I will send you, excuse me, the questionnaire and then a, an anonymized patient output. When we got the questionnaire, we fed it into a digital scanner that picked up all of the yes answers and reduced the 10 page questionnaire to two, maybe three pages of highly organized information from that patient, just the yes answers. So it'd take you two, three minutes to read it. It gave you the extraordinary ability of knowing where you needed to go with this person that you're about to meet mm -hmm. and where you don't need to go. Oh, interesting. The extraordinary ability basically to have a, a full picture of their, their health from beginning to now, right? Yeah. Which, we, which 
Do, my doctors never asked me about my adverse childhood experiences. Yeah, of course not. And, you know, so you, you know, I have eight aces. You know that I need probably meditation and yoga and. Well, the, 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 the first question with that is, and again, we discovered this in the department. I mean, we didn't begin this knowing the best approach to deal with it. Uh, but uh, the examiners in the department were the ones who worked this out. They would say to a patient, I see on the questionnaire that, mm. okay, you know, you were the one who discovered your father's body when he hanged himself, that you were molested a number of times as a kid, etc. <laughs> Can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? And we listened, period. No humbug about, oh, I'm so sorry, that must have been awful, no, how terrible. No, we listened, period. And we did one other thing that, again, the patients helped us understand. We implicitly accepted that person. We were calm and still nice to them and wanted to see them again. So, so you know, the, the first step in addressing, well, what do you do with that information? Ask the patient. You know, how has this affected you? Well, and, but that's the thing. I mean, with, prison, with the people in prison, that's exactly what we've been asking. Be, but it's the first time they've ever been asked. It's of like, course. how has of, this affected you? It's put me in prison. Of course. Well, that's, a, that's just the very beginning. That's a superficial right. answer. You know, how, how has it affected me in great detail in the way I feel, the way I respond to things, et cetera? Yeah, I, you know, I received letters. Uh, one, one, one man was stabbed. He, he's been recently stabbed, and now he's just the amount of anxiety in his body. He says he can, he can't meditate. He can't stop. He just, you know, he's just hyper vigilant all day long. Hypnotherapy has a role in situations like that. I'm a big believer in psychotherapy. On the other hand, psychotherapy, although it is beneficial and important, is also an inefficient process, hence very costly, hence unaffordable to most people. <clears throat> Hypnotherapy, uh, on the other hand, if you can find a, you know, a capable hypnotherapist, not somebody who just does stage tricks with it, um, uh, hypnotherapy has the advantage of often bringing about significant reduction in specific symptoms in a very small number of visits, one, two, three visits, et cetera. Um, and uh, if one is looking for uh, a hypnotherapist, the, um, let me see the name of the organization. Uh, they have a website. It's either, I think it's the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis is the, is the name of the organization, American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. Look at their website. They list by city and state across the country experienced hypnotherapists. So if you want to find, you know, well, who's an experienced hypnotherapist in the city near where I live, that would be the place to look and uh, make a beginning. So hypnotherapy is, very, very meaningful. Well, I'll use myself as an example. About oh, 30 years ago, 28 years ago, I had a very unusual kind of stroke, uh, a, the lining of a major blood vessel in the back of my neck up to my brain tore, and I had a cerebellar stroke, a cerebellum, that part of the brain that integrates movement. Amongst other things, I had intractable hiccups as a result of this. So 24 hours a day I was hiccuping or every waking moment I was hiccuping. And I had just met this guy, a psychologist in town who was a quite accomplished hypnotherapist. And uh, he called me uh, to see how I was doing. He had heard about the stroke and he hears the hiccuping and he says, well, maybe I ought to stop by. I, you can do a lot for hiccups with hypnosis. And I thought, well, you know, he's a nice guy, fine, have him stop by. So he comes by and he proposes to hypnotize me and I'm sitting there with my eyes closed, listening to all of the directions from him and thinking, you know, half hour goes by, no change. 
you know, nice that he wants to make believe he knows what he's doing, but I mean, I'm still wide awake with my eyes closed, etc. <clears throat> and uh, then my wife comes into the house two floors away through closed door. I can hear her putting the key into the lock from the garage to the house, two floors away through a closed door on my end. I thought, my God, you know, I've, I've, I've got the hearing of a hunting dog. <laughs> then she opens the door and two floors away, I can smell the perfume she's wearing like it's under my nose. And, you know, again, the hunting dog metaphor. And, you know, I'm thinking, this is absolutely incredible. And um, he says something to me, I forget what it was right now, it was, you know, seemingly unimportant kind of thing. And all of a sudden, my hiccup stopped. Wow. And he asks me to open my eyes. And my first words to him were, Brian, what did you do with my hiccups? And I thought, what, a, what an ungrateful thing to say. <laughs> you know, like what you do with my wristwatch, or, <laughs> et cetera. Um, so that was the end of my hiccups. Incredible. Days later, uh, I open the medicine cabinet and um, there I see my asthma sprays, which I have been using twice daily for 10 years or so. And I hadn't been using them for a week or so. I hadn't even noticed them. I mean, I saw them every day on the shelf. You know, they were there every day on the shelf when I opened the medicine cabinet, but somehow I did not see them. My asthma had disappeared. And he didn't know that I had asthma. Wow. So it was, I mean, it was really a quite extraordinary experience. You know, the first half hour, I'm thinking, well, it's nice he wants to make believe he knows what he's doing. But, you know, here I am wide awake, just sitting here politely with my eyes shut. And all of a sudden a profound change occurs. The hiccups totally disappear. And my asthma, which he knew nothing about, disappears. And you know, I had lung function testing done, no trace of it anymore, et cetera. Wow. Did you have any adverse childhood experiences? Well, I grew up in rather an isolated, an emotionally isolated house. That was about it. You know, it was a, a very well supported economically and, you know, sent to the best schools and so on, but basically an emotionally isolated house. Yeah, well, that's a, that sounds like an ace to me. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I, I had that, I had emotional abuse as a child, so, and a neglect, and neglect. Yeah, yeah, this is like emotional neglect, really. Um, you know, no one really was interested in how I thought about things or what I felt about things. You know, how you're doing in school, that mattered, yeah, uh, et cetera. But, uh, wow, I know it's just so sad to think of young Vince Folletti not being seen. I mean, look what, look what you've done for the world, you know, if your parents could only know, and yeah. That's my sense. We have 2.2 million people in prison. I, I, you're reminding me when I was in third grade, I remember the teacher says to me in front of the whole class, you know, insultingly, she says, the trouble with you, Vincent, is you ask too many questions. And I remember thinking in third grade that this really supported my increasing belief that grownups didn't really seem to know what the hell they were doing very well. <laughs> but, you know, that was the wrong thing to tell a kid in school that he's asking too many questions. <laughs> I mean, how, how else would you find out and know otherwise? <clears throat> I know. I mean, you've gotten one of the biggest puzzle pieces to our social dysfunction in, 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 on the planet. Yeah, and I mean, it's had major importance. And, you know, again, totally to my surprise, because... If someone had asked me initially, you know, are you interested in this? Not really. I mean, my background was doing adult infectious disease work, which I was pretty good at and I enjoyed enormously. And, you know, obesity, I mean, I put the program in place basically to get the damn problem out of the way because 
sending patients to see a dietitian, you know, to learn how to eat right was clearly a total waste of time. Um, and, um, you know, going down that path led to all sorts of unexpected discoveries. Asking you know, the right like questions. Obesity wasn't the problem. Obesity was the solution to problems that we typically knew nothing about because we were taught as children that there were certain things one does not talk about. Yeah, so cocaine is the solution. Um, yeah. Gambling's the solution. Workaholism is the solution. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, I mean, everyone listening to this podcast has one of those, uh, one or hundred things I haven't, coffee's the solution, right? It's, it's all so we can feel different than the way we feel right now. Exactly, yes. Yeah, and you know, let's, let's bring this awareness to the world. I mean, I know that's what you've started 20 years ago, but I'm an educated woman. I didn't learn I was traumatized till I was 55 years old. You might um, think about which major newspaper in the country might be interested in learning about what you're doing. <clears throat> At the New York Times, for instance, there's an editorial writer named David Brooks. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, when you email me to remind you about sending you the questionnaires, Remind me about that, and I think I have his uh, email address. He he wrote some interesting stuff about the A study years ago, and he might be very interested in hearing about this. And I think that would be you know useful for your efforts to get major publication in a newspaper like that. A fantastic yes, because it's time. Twenty twenty one is the year America becomes trauma informed. I'm just saying it. I'm planting a seed. And, you know, this interview is going out in two weeks, you know, we'll start the year right with your interview. And uh, wow. Is there anything else you want to tell um, America what about trauma or anything else? Well, if they're interested in learning more, simply type the words on the Internet, adverse childhood experiences study. And there will be probably a hundred pages of citations and references that suddenly come up. And then if they do the same thing, adverse childhood experiences study on YouTube, they'll see many presentations of what we learned on video. And if they have some specific question, like what's the relation of adverse childhood experiences to suicide? Okay, adverse childhood experiences study hyphen suicide or hyphen prison or hyphen um addiction addiction yeah, yeah. or hyphen uh divorce you see because it, it, addiction is a comforting idea the way it's handled it, it's handled as though addiction is due to characteristics that are intrinsic in some substance, you know, that somehow are going to grab a hold of your soul and lock you in. But what we found was exactly the opposite, that addiction is a logical function of response to, excuse me, life experiences that people typically know nothing about. A very, very important study illustrating this. In the closing years of the Vietnam War, a woman named Lee Robbins, R-O-B-B-I-N-S, went to Vietnam and interviewed 900 American soldiers who acknowledged to her, but not to the army, that they had used heroin daily for at least the antecedent 30 days. Okay, so by anyone's definition, you know, hardcore junkie. After they return to the United States, eight months later, she meets with each of them, goes all over the United States to meet these people again. Incredibly, eight months after getting home, 94% of them are no longer using heroin. Zero treatment because the army did not know anything about this, etc. Oh, isn't that interesting? You remove the cause and suddenly 
what we call the addiction disappears. So the cause was Vietnam. Yeah. It was war. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so when we're at war with our people, which we are, which obviously in many pockets of the United States we're at war with, yeah. higher rates of addiction, higher yeah. rates of adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's find a way to remove the cause. Dr. Folletti, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom well, and for figuring out this piece of the puzzle. Yeah, keep me in the loop of what you're doing because I am more than casually interested. <laughs> I know. Well, I will f send you all my findings as soon as I um, collect them and process them with uh, one of the men working, one of the men living in prison, um, Brandon Menard. I think you know him. I've, I've heard his name, yeah, and I've, and I've had some correspondence from Neil Strong. Yes, yes, yes. So they're yeah. helping. I just sent him some materials the other day, as a matter of fact. Right. These brilliant men living in prison processing yeah. Yeah. ACE quizzes, you know, doing, yeah. during math I could never imagine doing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Until Thank next you. time, thank you so much. And um, I know. I'll send you a few emails soon. Okay. Okay, take care. Oh my God. Thank you for listening to my interview with Dr. Folletti, Dr. Vince Folletti. What an incredible interview. Um, wow. Wow. Thank you so much for watching my interview with Dr. Vince Folletti, the co-creator of the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study. As usual, please subscribe to our podcast, like, share, and go to our website and take the Adverse Childhood Experiences quiz so you can learn more about your own childhood adversity and trauma. And reach out to us. We. Um, we're building our, our resources page and we are really working together to form communities of support and find out ways to bring healing and, and significant change of our childhood trauma. So thank you so much.